somebody asked a question uh, a while back, and actually I was scanning through my notes, and I found a question that was uh, that, that I had overlooked somehow. Um, regarding eunuchs that are in the Bible, you know, where Paul said, I think Paul was uh, referring to them, isn't it, it's a commandment to be fruitful and multiply. So, uh, I mean, already we have uh, things pointing towards a topic that most people don't want to touch, uh, which is, you know, homosexual relationships. You can't have a child, uh, you know, be fruitful and multiply that way. But um, is was Paul kind of condoning um, or telling people, you know, what if you don't want to have kids, you don't have to have kids? Because he said, if you were, you know, if you were married, you should remain. I mean, if you weren't married, you should remain as you are, whatever. I mean, Paul really had a sense of urgency on the idea of his Messiah returning like so soon. That they were like getting ready for it then. I think it's, and he probably got that from, uh, you know, Jesus telling them, you know, many of you, of course, this was much later, of course, but you know, many of you standing here with me will will not see death or will not taste death until they see the kingdom of heaven coming in its full glory. So, um, any comments on the whole um, not having to have kids sort of the connection uh, well, the, well, We're uh, good question. We're actually conflating. A lot of different, many different passages. It is very, uh, I find it uh, uh, ubiquitous. It's commonplace from, for uh, Christians or former Christians to kind of conflate Paul, what he wrote, and then what we find in the book of the book of Acts. We do have in Acts chapter eight. In fact, I uh, referred to it. In, earlier, and that's the Ethiopian eunuch who was converted, um, who, was con who was converted. Uh, that, so that's in the book of Acts. I, um, we get to Paul. Paul isn't dealing with eunuchs as much as he is dealing with uh, the, in, the, the, the importance or the lack of importance of getting married and holding the ideal of the ideal of celibacy of never being married to be one that is pristine he claims to have lived such a life that he had never been married he, he he holds that to be the ideal he does say that of course if you, you find it uh, to be an impossible life to live. This is so completely inconsistent with the Jewish scriptures, but we'll just set that aside. Uh, Paul says, look, if you can't, I'm paraphrasing slightly, if you can't control yourself and you need to have a, a sexual partner, again a paraphrase, then it's better to be married than to burn. The Catholic Church was not out of their mind for holding up celibacy, even though that becomes a completely formal uh, vow in, of the priesthood, really about a thousand years ago. In fact, uh, Catholic priests and bishops and so on had... Uh, been celibate much longer than that, but it became formally accepted. Well, the Catholic Church is not off base. I mean, there, it's a, a, a plain reading of Paul. And so there, there are two elements, and so that's what we find. Now, there is another passage in Isaiah, but I wanted to stay away from that for a moment. The, I, the idea of uh, that there is something virtuous about celibacy, not being married. Now, I want to be clear, and particularly for those listeners and viewers who are who are Jewish, who are not really familiar with what Christians believe. Christians, I don't want you listening to the show thinking that Christians believe that uh, people should not get married. Uh, Christians regard the, mar the marriage vow as something sacred, uh, a sacred s a sacrament, and, and so on. I don't want you to think about that. But there is this idea, this, uh, this stench that, well, if you're celibate, that's the highest standard, and Paul conveys that very readily. 
Where would he be getting that from? He wouldn't be getting from the Jewish Bible because the Torah immediately tells Adam that he sh- and tells his, his progeny that it is vital. I mean, God did an amazing thing with Adam. Unlike every other creature in the world, both plant and animal life, the scripture testifies that God created male and female, but with human beings, Hashem did not create a female when he created Adam. Didn't do that. Um, and it, just so people understand that Genesis chapter 1 is like, um, you know how in, in Lahavdil, but it's probably a good, par- uh, a good metaphor, uh, in a newspaper, you have so you'll have a story there's a headline and then you know there's like a sub headline that's in italics like the headline is like three four five words that are like bold and that gets your attention of the very general idea and then below that there is a a a sort of a a a secondary headline that gives you the overall picture of the story it's typically in italics, and then if you want to read all the whole details, so then the story then continues, we read the entire long story. Now, very often you can get the big picture from the italics, but you can't get the details. In some way, that's what's happening in Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 is just, God is sovereign, he created everything. He created fish. But once scripture tells us that God created fish, Fish are not going to be coming up in the Bible. They, they may be tangential or ancillary to a story, but they are not the story. We're not, God did not create the universe for fish. So Genesis 1 is that God is sovereign. He created the world. And then Genesis 2 pulls back and actually breaks it down. And, and there it comes into view that, in fact, God created Adam without a female. Adam had to look at every creature, and he had to conclude that in fact um, he was alone you know and unlike the animal world where they procreate just for the sake of procreation for any many animals like cats it's a very painful violent experience and our sages tell us it's not an accident that humans when they make children they see each other eye to eye other animals that is not the way they produce children. They become one. Their neshama, their soul becomes one. It's a, it's a spiritual experience that's enhanced by a physical uh, intimacy that can, where, where, where two people become one. It's completely unique. And, and when, when, when the men and a woman kiss in the sanctity of marriage, they, why are they kissing? Why don't they rub their, their elbows together? Because <laughs> this, this is important. The, the reason why there is that type of expression of affection is because it is through this, through the, through the airways where God breathed into every, every person, his divine spirit. That means our essence is here. It's not in our elbows. So when people, when two people who love each other dearly, they kiss with so much passion because they really, they want to like, I want to taste you. I want to feel you. Like, who are you? I want to feel all of you and, uh, and imagine an intimate moment that ha- there was no kiss. It would have been, it, you will have stripped that experience completely. So, Adam has to discover not a, a piece of machinery with which he can genetically reproduce uh, uh, and, and make children. That's not what's in view. We'll come to that later, and it pretty, runs pretty fast in Genesis 5. No, no, no. It, he, Adam had to realize that that which with he was going to not only produce offspring and be the mother of mankind, was a part of him, his neshama. And he had to feel it and want it and, and, and realize that every other creature in the world was completely on every level incompatible with him. And then he was, and then he, Hashem took the female from him, wasn't a separate creation. And, and this is what's in view. Now, when you take that, 
you go, Hashem, I love you. I mean, how could you not, when reading Genesis properly and understanding what Hashem wants, and that is, that means that woman, according to Jewish tradition, 40 days before a child was born, a voice comes out of heaven and declares who they're going to marry. Don't ask me a million questions on this. It just, but the point is, there is a, a, a help mate. There is a, your other half is there. You ate so your, your helpmate. She's a part of you. She's not someone with whom you are just compatible with to genetically produce offspring. Now, that's the highest level. That's the highest standard. But as you will know, my friends, uh, Judaism had competing, there were competing ideas that said the Jews were wrong. And these ideas were well known in the I'll give you one example. I can go on endlessly with this, but there were influences that saw this world as basically an evil world, that physical pleasure was basically not the ideal. In Judaism, it's taking physical pleasure and raising it up to heaven. That's what it's all about. It's about bringing children to this world, and, and the intense pleasure there is in bringing children means that you are now becoming a partner with God in the creation process. Uh, in Judaism, we, in every aspect of our holidays, no, take delicious food, but make a bracha on it, raise it up to Hashem. The greatest, most ecstatic dream ever envisioned in scripture is the one that Jacob had. And what did he see? It wasn't the ladder in heaven. It was a, a ladder that connected earth with heaven and God was on the top and it was that connection of heaven and earth that's so beautiful. But I will say to you, my friends, that there are enemies of the Jewish faith. There are enemies of, of the ideas that are proclaimed and celebrated in the Jewish scriptures. As an example, the Gnostics, they were just one. But the Gnostics who were, I know you're going, what's Gnostics? The word comes from the word gnosis, a Greek word, which means knowledge, but I'm not, it's it's not germane to this question. I'm not going to get like what knowledge. Go look in the Gospel of Thomas. I mean, it's not a, okay. The key. I only want to focus on one point. That is, it was a central feature of many of the religions and mystery religions that this world that we are on, this world which has considerable amount of suffering, it was created by an evil god created by an evil deity. We had to figure out a way to disconnect from this world and disconnect from its pleasures. This was a, a, a culture, a spiritual idea, worldview that was pervasive throughout the ancient world. I know to you this sounds weird. Incidentally, there are Gnostic churches to this day around the world, particularly after the discovery of some Gnostic Gospels in the last century. But that's, again, not true, but the key point is that there was a kind of thinking that is to us seems odd, but was huge in the ancient world, that this was a bad world, it was an evil world, and if you can not have any pleasure, if you cannot have any, uh, if you cannot uh, be intimate with your wife, it, that would be the, the ideal if you could not have any pleasure. Uh, um, the, 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 those who subscribe to uh, Marcion, a uh, second century uh, great Christian thinker from Asia Minor, and this is the way they thought. And this was in, I know you go, well, those were cults. Those were not mainstream Orthodox Christianity. Wrong. It depend what, depended on what city you lived in. In certain areas, in North Africa and so on, that Gnostic Christianity was the norm. And the other kinds of Christianity, which you, which you would call apostolic Christianity, which we would call orthodoxy, they, was, they actually had different names in themselves because it really depended on which version of Christianity got there first. So this is the influence that Paul is espousing. He, Paul is stuck with a, a, a Jewish formula, he, he's not, he, what he is doing is he is refashioning uh, Judaism into a Greek 
uh, religion and a and incorporating mystery ideas that are well known in in the mystery religion world. So therefore, these ideas are going to emerge from Paul. Now, uh, one other point I'll just tell you, and that is that there are some uh, Christian scholars that say that the reason why Paul uh, advocated not getting married, uh, the reason why Jesus was never married. And then suddenly there is no verse anywhere in the Christian Bible that says that Jesus wasn't married. I know that might shock you, and I'm not saying he was married or not married, or I'm not saying that. I, I'm, it's just stupid sensationalism and just not relevant to anything. But the only thing I find interesting is that I think if Christians found out that Jesus was married, it would actually interfere with their being able to believe that he's the Messiah. How ridiculous when we look at Ezekiel in 46, uh, where the Messiah has a family, has children, and so on. What? He's not married? David was married. Not a problem. But, but the key is that there is a thinking that Paul was what's embraced what is called an apocalyptic eschatology. And the apoc I, I don't find this a very... Uh, a very convincing argument, but he embraced the idea that the world was coming to an end and it was imminent. And this goes to your other point. There's no question that the early Christians believed that it was happening. Jesus was making a second coming and it was happening now. And we don't find that in John, but we do find that in the earlier writings, particularly in the writings of Paul, Paul's writings are, this may surprise you, but are the earliest writings that survived. There may be a Christian writing that never survived, that we don't have. In fact, we know there are. We know there are. There is a source that Matthew and Luke were appealing to, were copying from, which did not survive. It only survives in Matthew and Luke. We know that uh, there's a letter that Paul wrote to, to Corinth that, we don't have any longer, but you know that's expected. But we could just talk about what has survived. I mean, there was they embraced the idea that the world was about to come to an end. That was the thinking. So therefore, in the Synoptic Gospels, the idea where Jesus is, we are told, says uh, there are many here, many standing here who will not taste of death until the kingdom comes. Um, you know. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass until these things. Well, the generation passed, and it didn't happen, you know. And and when Paul is describing the rapture of the church in in First Thessalonians four, he is as straightforward away. For the the idea was that the believers would be sucked in, you know, would 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 go into heaven to the clouds, whatever it is, and and then judgment would come on earth. Christians asked Paul at the time, well, uh, announcement, 1 Thessalonians is probably the earliest surviving Christian writing, written probably about 50. Now, uh, Paul is asked, well, so, so, for, so let's just say the crucifixion happened at 30, which is what, what most Christians would say, okay? And first of all, you know, is, is written about 50, 40. Let's just say 50, make it easy, okay? That means there's a 20-year gap. 20 years was a lot of time in the ancient world when the average human expected lifespan was less than 30. So people, there were Christians who had already died by the time Paul is writing this letter. And he's asked the question, well, what happens to the Christians who died? Like, we're going to cloud. And Paul says, they will join us. Meaning, the expectation was that the Christians, Paul and his Christians who were alive in 50, uh, they expected to be going up into the, to the sky to escape judgment on earth. And that's where they'll be with Jesus, and that's where they'll be saved. So it's very clear, abundantly clear, that the early Christians thought, what, that's probably the reason why there was no Christian Bible in the early days. Like, why did it take so long for Matthew, Mark, Luke, John to be written at the end of the first century? It's very likely that the earliest Christians said, like, what do we need a book for? There's no time for books. We're going. Okay? So that, that would 
very possibly explain why there was possibly explain why there was no books at an earlier stage. So you there are some skulls who argue. I don't subscribe to this, but I might as well give you the fuller answer. And say, look, these are uh, these are people who 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 embrace this apocalyptic eschatology. The Roman Empire was going to be gone, done, goodbye. We're all going to collapse. What's the point of getting married and having children? This world, as we know it, is coming to an end. There's going to be a kingdom of God on earth. That's synoptic. John, the kingdom of God is in heaven. Because John has written, let's say, 90, 95, about 15 years after Matthew and Luke. Everybody's done at that point. There's no point in talking about the kingdom on earth. They're all gone. So there are Christian uh, scholars who say it was the apocalyptic view, like why, well, that has nothing to do with the Jewish scriptures. So that's where this idea, so let's, these are all separate. The story of the Ethiopian eunuch, that's in, in Acts chapter 8. Paul talking about his, his admonishment about marriage and so on, that's in the letters of Paul. That's not the book of Acts. And, People are frequently conflate the two. The book of Isaiah in chapter 56, uh, verse 3, just says that no one should give up hope, and even if you don't have children, it doesn't mean necessarily a person who was, who was castrated in order for them to work in the palace around the queen, but let not a person who s says, I don't have children, I don't have it, I, no one should ever give up hope, and don't say that. But that's where the idea of that in any way celibacy should be celebrated, that's so, that's, I don't, I'm not trying to rebut it, that's some spitting in the Torah scroll. That's spitting in God's face. That is ripping out the heart of, of, of the message of Genesis. You must leave your father's house and, and cleave unto your wife, who is literally your other half, and you will become one flesh, uh, that, which means restoring it. You get it? It's like a beautiful full circle. Woman came from man. She wasn't created from dirt. Women are different. They're, on, they're spiritually on a higher level. We all know that. Okay, women may not think so. Women could be critical of the, of each other, but men know that women are more faithful and all the. So what happens is God is saying, "Look, men and women are separate," and then just bring it back to that full circle. Mm -hmm. It is the Torah. There is no Moses was the greatest anti-missionary in human history. Mm -hmm. 